I'm Jennifer Greenfeld. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Environment and Planning. I don't have 40 years of history of parks, but 27, so I'm learning still. Um, and I'm so thrilled to welcome our panel today. Uh, it's our sort of uh, last stop before we have a little bit of break. And um, I'm just going to let everybody introduce themselves, and then we're going to get into a few questions I have prepared and what we might want Elizabeth to share with us as well. So Dustin, why don't you start off? Sure. So hi, everyone. Nice to be here today. I am Dustin Partridge. I'm the Director of Conservation and Science at New York City Bird Alliance, formerly New York City Audubon. We just changed recently. And what we do as an organization is we work to protect birds and their habitats across the five boroughs of New York City. And that's for all New Yorkers. Great. Good morning. I'm Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm the executive director of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Mara did me the pleasure of introducing our organization a little bit in her background on the Forever Wild program. We were formed in 2012 and work as a close partner to New York City Parks to advance the care of natural areas across the five boroughs. Hi, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to the New York Botanical Garden. I'm Todd Forrest. I'm head of horticulture here at NYBG, um, and I'm just, just thrilled beyond belief to see this collection of practitioners and researchers and advocates all assembled here today. So thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Victoria Toro. I'm the outreach manager at the Bronx River Alliance, and we are in public-private partnership with New York City Parks to protect, improve, and restore the Bronx River Corridor and work in partnership with many of the folks uh, in this space to do that. Thank you so much. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Elizabeth, you, you sort of answered this question a little bit, but we, we didn't give you a lot of time, so I'm going to see if you want to expand a little bit on... Um, on the impact that we actually can have in New York City. We hear your numbers, four billion tons, thousands and thousands of acres. Um, these threats we know are serious, um, but why does what we're doing in New York City matter um, to these things that you, you have firsthand observed and write about? Is this on? Yep. yep. Okay, well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons, you know, to, to work locally and and to celebrate local efforts um you know and and one of them is uh, obviously for the creatures you know that that live in these these areas and there are a lot of i think one of the things that that we're learning there are a lot of species that you know have very actually have very restricted ranges um you know and are especially our our, our our arthropod friends our amphibian friends and if you can preserve you know, even a relatively small patch of land, you can potentially preserve habitat for many species. They're not the charismatic species, but they are key species for ecosystem uh, functioning. Um, and then from there, you get, and I know that this was mentioned by in, 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 in one of in one of Merritt's slides, I think, is, is is this idea of connectivity. And that is absolutely crucial. I believe that's been proved over and over again. So you do need, you know, species to, to repopulate uh, areas that hopefully are going to be restored in the future. So that's another key reason to preserve what you can at any given moment. Um, and I think, you know, the third issue, and there are probably many, many more that I haven't even thought of, but obviously is, and you are all involved in this, so I don't need to tell you this, but obviously is connecting people in a very, very, um, in you know, human-made landscape to a, a different landscape, a landscape that, you know, we all know has a lot of human fingerprints in it, but that uh, is as natural as, as, as a lot of New York City residents are going to see see in much of their lives. And so I think that that connection, um, you know, and people always do talk about connecting kids to nature. I think that is absolutely crucial. It becomes more and more crucial the more time kids spend in the virtual world of their screen. And that connection, I think, is tragically, you know, being lost. So I think any time that, you know, we can get school kids, any kids out, into these places that, that you all are, 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 are protecting and preserving that will potentially change, change hearts and minds and lives. So those are just three of, I'm sure, many other good reasons. Thanks. Um, I'm already going to go off 
script in order <laughs> because Victoria, um, something you know, what Elizabeth just said sort of inspired me to jump to you. Um, the title of this panel is From Global to Local, right? And the, the truth is when I spoke to everybody, a lot of people talked about really the, the flip of that is starting local and going to global. And Victor, I'd love it if you could share some of your stories, um, really great ones, about how you've observed that sort of connection starting in the Bronx. Sure, absolutely. So I, I do think of many examples. One that comes to mind is um, a local community member, Mundo, who is the Bronx River Grooming Team uh, chair, who start, is a lifelong Bronx River resident in the South Bronx, who you know actually started out opposed to the idea of a park expansion, Starlight Park, uh, because maybe it would make the houses along Bronx River Road less safe if there was a park there that was attractive instead of a junkyard with a mean dog in it, right? Um, and so, but with, through like community engagement, advocacy, and just talking to other local folks who are really um, engaged on the issue um, has not only became a convert, but now is like a leader in this space of Greenway advocacy um, and is a, a steer, not only a chair of the Bronx River Greenway team, but is also um, a steering committee member of a citywide Greenways coalition and is a incredibly influential community voice um, in, uh, you know, advocating for, but also like fighting potentially harmful projects along the Bronx River, for example, proposed highway expansions, things like that, things that have huger regional impacts. Um, and um, I think of other volunteers. I think of SYEP students that we engage who, you know, sorry, last- SYEP? Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, sorry. Uh, summer Youth Employment Program. Um, students uh, that are high school students who uh, had, you know, a week or two weeks worth of programming canceled because of poor air quality, because of wildfires that were taking place across the continent, right? You know, things that are impacting them locally that then, you know, we are all connected by our air, by our water, um, that they are gonna be the next leaders of this movement. And we are such a densely populated area in the Bronx that those individuals, like the sky's the limit for like how we can change the world when they are thinking about these things on a hyper-local level. Um, yeah. Thanks. So Todd. Um, here we are sitting at the New York Botanical Garden, a 130-year-old institution um, that certainly makes um, good use of its space and has uh, engaged its neighbors, but really you have this international reputation. Um, but lately, we're seeing the conservation work, in particular, um, at NYBG shift to focus on urban nature. Um, taking the hiring of Eric uh, Sanderson as the VP for urban conservation as sort of case in point. So uh, can you share a little bit about why this was an, an important shift? Was it a purposeful shift? How did that come about at NYBG? Um, well, simply put, it's because cities are where the people are. Um, and people are the cause of a lot of these issues, all of these issues that we're seeing. And ultimately, people are going to have to be the solution. Uh, to all of these issues. Uh, we as an institution um, have been working on two kind of extreme geographic scales. Uh, our scientists have been documenting plant biodiversity across the globe, and our conservation efforts have been focused on areas of very high biodiversity and very high risk. So think the coastal forests of Brazil, think the South Pacific um, nation of Vanuatu. Um, conversely, we've been working really hard on this site since 1895 to take care of nature here. But the scale that I think that we have not focused on as much as we should have and we are changing to focus on more is the local scale in New York City and the regional scale through the Bronx River watershed. You know, how can we be great conservers of plant biodiversity in Vanuatu and not similarly great conservers uh, of plant biodiversity here in New York City and in the Bronx? Um, so really, the motivation for the shift is that we want to make a difference as an institution on a global scale, and maybe the best and most powerful way to do that is to make a difference with conservation on a local scale. Thanks. <clears throat> Dustin, you're up next. Um, so 
we've been talking a lot about New York City, the five boroughs of New York City, and we all know here that nature doesn't really know what New York City means. Um, they are where it is where it is. Um, and birds are particularly immune to political borders. So um, might you be able to share how your work at the New York Bird Alliance is, um, does or even can we move the needle beyond New York City? Yeah, so there's a great example actually locally that connects all of us on the stage. And um, for the birders in the room, you may know this, but right nearby here at South Brother Island, which is managed and owned by New York City Parks, um, that's the largest wading bird colony in the entire Northeast. So nowhere else has this. This is hundreds of pairs of herons and egrets that are nesting right here. Those birds that are here are foraging. They're able to survive and provide food for their young by foraging in the Bronx River, which is protected by Bronx River Alliance. They're going to restored habitats that have been restored by Natural Areas Conservancy in New York City Parks. And they're coming up here and foraging in the Botanical Garden. If you're out on a walk later on today, you might actually see one, keep an eye out. And that's important for us. It's important for engagement because they're fun birds. You get to go out and see these and they're, they're special. People in New York get to experience this. But these birds don't spend their entire lives here. Many of these birds move and they're gonna travel from here to South and Central America and people there will experience them. They'll help to um, maintain ecosystems in those areas, capture pests, uh, move, move nutrients. It's important, and what we're doing locally really does have a global impact. Thanks. Um, uh, Sarah, um, so as you know, you, your organization got sort of a shout out in Mart's talk, Natural Areas Conservancy, a whole different way of of thinking about conservancies interacting with parks, right? Because nature is not just in one park, we need to think of it as a system. Uh, so it's sort of a, a new approach to the conservancy model. But is there something really unique about the way NAC works and other organizations like this approach your work? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for that question. And in preparing for this, was thinking about something that our colleague, Dr. Erica Spenson, said back when we were kind of evaluating the first few years of our work. And she used the term bridge organization. And I think a lot about that role of bridging, bridging science into policy, bridging policy into advocacy, bridging local into national. And I'll just give an example of um, using the forest management framework that Marit called out was jointly created by New York City Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy in 2017 using decades of data from the Natural Resources Group, but five years of intensive data collection and analysis from the ecological assessment, which we talked about, to pull together a citywide vision that was tied to an ecological model, but also to a financial model, and laid out a 25-year roadmap for the care of forested natural areas across the five boroughs at the scale of our full city. For us, it's been hugely important to take that really data-rich um, plan that was created together in partnership into our work as advocates with groups like the Forest for All NYC Coalition, which is a coalition of 130 institutions around New York City. Using that work, we've successfully advocated for over $20 million of increased investment in our forested natural areas, but we're also able to pass legislation in 2023 to create the first ever forest management um, plan for New York City, working in partnership with other advocates with the idea that we can chart a course towards increasing our city's canopy from 22 to 30% through this kind of mix of um, public investment and institutional knowledge, collaboration across sectors, and a uh, real sort of political commitment that brings together our, our many branches of government and many agencies. And then just to pitch the last panel of the day, the yeah. next step for you was doing... Yeah, so when, after, when we were writing the forest management framework for New York City, we had been very inspired by um, the Green Seattle Partnership in Seattle. We'll hear a little bit from Ashley Robles later today, but we were really surprised how hard it was to figure out how other cities were approaching the care of natural areas. And we conducted a national survey 
We heard back from over 100 cities, and 90% of the recipients said that they weren't in active communication with practitioners outside of the city where they worked, which led us to create the Forests and Cities Network, which has grown from 12 cities to 21 cities. And we'll hear from panelists from that um, network later today. And I think another form of bridging is this idea of sharing knowledge in the face of a really rapidly changing climate and of threats that are new on the scene and we're trying to figure out how to adapt to them and address them while also being really rooted in the community aspect of our work, learning not from global organizations but from other local organizations in a really intentional way certainly strengthened our work in New York City and I think has really served to strengthen the work of our partners across the country. Thanks. Um, to go a couple of different directions. So Elizabeth, your last book was, is H is for hope. And you skipped over D is for despair. You didn't name it <laughs> D is for despair, right? So I'm, I'm sort of curious. It, it's, a, it's kind of a rough book, actually, even though you're like ready for hope. Um, so just curious if you might want to share some thoughts about how you wanted to balance that storytelling, which is, you know, the artwork is fabulous, but it's a little grim, um, with going for the H, for the O. Well, as I, as I, as I sometimes have to confess, oh, the H which is for mind? hope is a bit of a... Oh, oh, sorry, the H is for hope is a, is a, is a bit of a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think, you know, I, I was really... You know, this is this is very, you know, about the the difficulty of, of writing about a subject that is unrelentingly grim and only going to get grimmer. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this this room knows that no matter what you hear, you know, this problem is getting worse. It is, is not getting better in the lifetime of anyone in this room, um, and that's a that's a grim message. And people turn away from that message. I understand that. Um, we were talking about. Uh, that before people's kids turn away, they don't really want to hear that, and who can possibly blame them? Um, so this was a this book was an attempt to look at sort of the stories uh, that we tell ourselves about climate change, and there's there's sort of this hopeful story, it's all going to be okay, and there's this doom story, we're all going to be doomed, and the truth is probably you know a combination of of the two. There are a lot of things that we could do to mitigate the damage. We are not doing them, I will be frank, and say we're not doing what we should be doing, um, but we could do that. So that is a hopeful, you know, that, that is a hopeful message. Um, but there's going to be a lot of damage, and you all are going to see it, you know, in your work, you already are seeing it. Um, so those, you know, how to carry both of those ideas in your mind, you know, forward, that, that was sort of the, the hope of the book, these, you know, we want, we like these binary narratives, you know, happy endings, you know, apocalyptic ending, and, you know, we're going to get something, you know, in the mushy and not very pleasant middle, I'll, I'll be frank. Todd, when we talked beforehand, sort of chatting about this panel, you had some pretty inspirational words for what sort of keeps you hoping and coming back to the garden every day in your work. Would you share a few of those with us? Yeah, I'm not accustomed to be being um, anything but the most pessimist person in a room. Um, <laughs> that's just the way it's the way I roll. Um, uh, but I'll, yeah, I know it's uh, I'm just flustered. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 what I will say is that, um, and of course, Elizabeth is exactly right. Um, you know, the facts you can't fudge the facts; they are what they are. But what we do here in the garden um, on this hyper-local scale, in the garden itself, uh, we've been working in the 50-acre Thane family forest, uh, which is the reason why the garden was established on the site in the 1890s. It was considered the most miraculous piece of nature in New York City at that time. Um, but of course, it's not unaltered by human activity. It's actually significantly altered by human activity. And for the past two decades, give or take, um, we, in a very sort of data-driven way, in a very slow and systematic way, have been trying to solve problems kind of one at a time. Um, so we identify something that we think, an anthropogenic disturbance that we think we can affect. Um, we go after it, we measure the results, we learn from those results, and we move on. And so this kind of incremental and focused and data-driven approach has driven positive change in the forest. 
Uh, and we've seen uh, certain invasive species which were abundant and growing, which were looming, were threatening to take over the whole, farmers, the whole forest, have diminished in their abundance. Um, and so the hope that I get in the work that we're doing in the forest is the hope that we share with our partners across New York City is that all we can do is what we can do. Um, and if we all do what we can do together, we can make small positive steps. And of course, to have the big change happen, we have to work as citizens to help that change happen. But as practitioners, we will make New York City healthier, more vibrant, more biodiverse, and more functional as part of the larger systems to which it is connected and for which it is essential. And I, and I refuse to give up that hope. There we go. Thank you. Can I add something? I really appreciate both of you. Um, and I just want to add something that indigenous people and people of the global south and people from environmental justice communities like have been already suffering the brunt of these impacts and for much longer than like the average like white middle class, you know, um, American has been. And so like to give in to despair from this like relative place of privilege when folks who have been marginalized for much longer and have already suffered a form of apocalypse in a lot of ways um, have been persevering and have been advocating, I think um, it would do a huge disservice and like further injustice to those communities. So like we have no choice but to, from our place of privilege, like persevere and keep pushing and like find the small wins and advocate for the bigger wins and like do what we can. Um, because other folks and people of color and people from, you know, the South Bronx who have been fighting um, for better air quality and more access to green spaces for a long time um, deserve like everyone else to like be in on the fight 100%. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Dustin. So in the conversation about hope, I was thinking about where I find hope in some of the work that we do at New York City Bird Alliance. And I actually find a lot of hope in our grimmest work, which is maybe a strange place to so, find sorry, it. Sorry, you don't mean grimmest, the Mets, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. okay. No, I, Just check. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's, um, so one of the biggest challenges in New York City is that we have um, hundreds of thousands of birds that, that die every year in window collisions. And we have dedicated volunteers from across the five boroughs that are going out and seeing these, these birds and they're, they're, they want to make a difference. So they volunteer and they go out and we've collected data and we have people, and it's in these volunteers that I find the most hope because that's a tough job to wake up every morning before work, go out and find piles, sometimes hundreds of dead birds, and, and try to help them. And what that's resulted in is New York City having the most comprehensive bird-friendly building legislation. And then the world looks at us and see if we could do this, if we can get this bird-friendly building legislation in place, we can stop killing birds here, we can do it anywhere. And that helps across everywhere that birds are flying. How, how, how did you do that? How did you get that legislation passed? Yeah, so uh, a, 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 a that was possible because of two things that were discussed today. It was in large part data and people. So we, we conduct the science, we conduct the research to understand where and why bird collisions are happening. And we connect that with the dedicated people that are waking up early, that care about these collisions that are going out. And together, that's a really compelling story for the city of New York. We understand it, we know what we could do to stop these collisions, it's pretty easy. We just need to fix our, our glass and turn our lights out. And that makes a difference. It's great. It's a good lesson. Um, so my um, uh, advisor in forestry school, uh, very sort of Bill Birch was William Birch was his name. He's a social scientist, and um, he really made his name in the academic world working in forestry in the tropics. And he had this sort of serendipitous meeting with the head of the Baltimore Parks and Recreation Department, and he had this. Um, like a, a epiphany um, that, wait a second, we don't have to go far away to learn and do good in the environment. We can actually do it where we live and really establish an urban focus to the forestry school um, because of that. And he, you know, he used to say, we can learn more in a summer in Baltimore than we can learn in a year in Nepal. And I'm, I, I mean, I have a lot of theories of why that's true. Um, just in terms of kind of the concentration of people, academics, 
uh, creativity that's really generated in a, in a city um, and, and really inspires innovation. So thinking about that, are there specific examples you might want to share that you think this would, this is only, this could only happen in New York or pick another city, but you know, we know lots of things can only happen in New York. <laughs> Any thoughts? I mean, this is kind of maybe bridging the last question and sure. this question, but I was thinking a lot about, there was a quote that I heard a long time ago that said something along the lines of, the least you can do is to figure out what you hope for, and the most you can do is to live inside that hope. And this idea, One more time. the least you can do is to figure out what you hope for, and the most you can do is to live inside of that hope. And that idea of taking the thing you wish for, maybe, or even sort of scared to wish for because of how implausible it seems, even if that end goal, ending climate change, protecting global biodiversity, like even if those end goals aren't attainable or fully attainable, feeling the inspiration to want to work towards them, I think can actually be a source of a lot of hope and be a source of a lot of inspiration. and being able to take that one step further and to create that opportunity for others, I think can be very meaningful. And one thing that came to mind with your question is our shared work on creating a citywide trail system, which is not about protecting or restoring individual habitats, but is about inviting New Yorkers from all across the city into the natural world just to enjoy it. So not like bringing people into that next step of trying to force them to take a certain kind of action or be a certain kind of resident, but to just say, these are places that exist for you and you are welcome here and we care enough about you and your experience to make these places that you want to spend time, feel safe spending time and can enjoy. And I think that sort of like first step, not feeling you have to take it to the very end point can be really inspiring. Thanks. Victoria, do you, this just, um, would you love to share your sort of personal story, how you got involved in the Bronx River? Sure. Um, I actually grew up in the watershed of the Bronx River, not knowing that it was a real river. I thought it was a water feature of the zoo. Um, <laughs> truly. Like, <laughs> the Bronx River that, like, the most common way I thought of the Bronx River was the Bronx River Parkway, the highway. Um, and didn't even know that they were being, <laughs> that there were, there were so many people and so much energy and so much community organizing that had gone into like, um, protecting this native space and, and, um, restoring it until I was an adult, um, already, you know, with a marine science degree, thinking that I had to leave the city, leave the Bronx completely to be able to, um, protect the environment, because um, there was no environment in the Bronx, um, and I was completely wrong. Um, but it, that speaks to just, I, I in the pandemic, looking for just ways to be outside in a way that felt safe, um, started volunteering with the Bronx River Alliance, just cleaning up Starlight Park, and fell in love with like the mission of the organization, the folks um, who worked there, um, and the river itself and became the recreation system, I'm now the outreach manager. And I just want to make sure that like the kids in the neighborhood that I grew up in know about the river, know they can canoe on it, know that they can protect it, and know that it can be a true resource for them and that they can stay here and protect it and work in green um, career fields. And, you know, if they want, yes, like absolutely you know, become part of the global movement um, on climate justice, but like that start that has to start at home, I think, so yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, we might have, a, I think we'll have a few minutes, so think if you have a burning question for this group, but first I just wanna open it up to you guys to see if you have any specific questions for Elizabeth as these guys are thinking of their questions. Um, scary fish stories, <laughs> which we have some of our own. Uh. I had a question. We, you know, we um, those of us who work with young people think a lot about kind of what is that like spark moment that gets folks interested in this topic. And I was curious if you could share what your experience was that sort of moved you to make this your life's work. 
Um, well, I don't, you know, I don't have like, you know, an epiphany moment. I am a urban, you know, suburban kid. And I, I think what was very important in my own life, and this is not, I, I really don't advocate it because it's very carbon intensive activity. <laughs> but my parents used to take us, it's kind of a, when my my grandfather was a was a refugee from Germany, and he was a big um, fan of. Has anyone heard of Karl May? Books by Karl May. Okay, so he was this German who never left Germany, but he wrote about the American West very evocatively, supposedly, according to my grandfather, um, and according to millions of readers. He's like one of the maybe has sold more books than anyone else on the planet um, over time. He was a hugely important figure in his day, and. Uh, my grandfather was a huge fan. He moved his family to this country for unfortunate reasons and decided he had to see the West, you know, that he had read about from Karl May. And so he used to take my mother out and aunt out West every summer. And then she, my mother continued that. We used to go out West um, very often or, you know, every other summer. And that had a huge impact on me, seeing these places that really, once again, I now know were not really wild, uh, but that... Um, it gave the impression of being wild. And I do think that that was really significant in my own life and why I think that any way that we can, one of the reasons that I think that any way that you can connect people with a sense of something different, um, not just the landscape, the urban landscape that they are growing up in, some other sense of sort of possibility and, and, and in some ways escape, I think, um, is very uh, important um, so that's sort of the background of my own interest in in the environment. Anything else before I hop to the uh, yeah, Just a quick question. Uh, many of the people in this room are practitioners. Uh, Elizabeth, people who have devoted their professional lives um, to working with nature, in this case in, in New York City. Um, and you've traveled probably more than any of us looking at uh, these problems and asking these questions. Have you run into any groups of practitioners or uh, efforts, restoration efforts, um, that you found particularly kind of interesting or smart or compelling? Well, I'll, 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 I'll be honest and say that, you know, when I go looking for, for something, it is, I often am looking at the edge of what's, you know, possible or maybe impossible, you know, so um, the very, you know, crucial, um, you know, replanting efforts and reseeding efforts are, um, you know, those are the, the, backbone of these efforts and they're not, you know, they're sort of something we take for granted, I suppose, probably the public and, and certainly journalists, you know, so I've always gone, you know, looking for things that are, you know, on some level wildly ambitious. So one piece that I wrote was about um, this wild place in uh, the Netherlands, which they had convinced it was a whole manufactured landscape uh, in the Netherlands, they, they, one of these places they'd redeemed from the sea and they were trying to turn it into, you know, Europe as it had been, um, you know, thousands of years ago. And they had imported all these animals. These animals had done so well that a lot of them were starving to death. And that became a huge, you know, political issue because people didn't like to see that, even though it was part of this, you know, natural cycle. Um, so I, I offered that as just, and it was a really interesting, it was on some level extremely successful, right? They had, you know, thousands of, of, of deer, um, for example, and they were, and migratory birds were being attracted to it, and, and, and they had incredible success, but it was this very interesting story of, you know, humans in the landscape and what humans are willing to tolerate, you know, when they look at the landscape. So you must face that all the time, you know, what, what looks good and what is actually functional, those are not necessarily the same thing. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, um, so uh, in, your, in your talk, you're talking about um, actions that are happening now and geologic timescales, and there's this idea of shifting baselines, right? As humans, we have a very short memory about what is natural, what our end goals are. For the practitioners and myself and the practitioners in the room, how do you recommend as a storyteller getting people to understand short-term restoration versus long-term restoration and what those goals are with regard to our own baselines constantly changing? Well, I think that's a really good question. And honestly, you know, I'm going to 
once again, I, I guess I would, I would almost turn that back to you because you, you are on the front lines and dealing with people much more directly, you know, who are concerned about that distinction than I am. But I guess to offer a partial answer, I would say, I, you know, I, th I think it's useful to be honest with people. I mean, I think it's useful to, to say, like, look, you know, this landscape has been many things over, over time. Um, you know, this is what we're aiming for. There's always, there's always sort of this debate and it can become quite acrimonious. You know, what are we restoring to, right? And I think that, um, but I think at the end of the day, if you peel away the acrimony and you're just sort of frank and say, look, this, this is the best we can do. This is what we're trying to do right now. Maybe there is a moment where, you know, we will be able to expand our ambitions. Um, I, I think people, I like to think, and once again, you have more experience than I do. I like to think that people will accept that, and I don't think, you know, I don't think those arguments are that productive. You know, we can only do what we can do right now. Thanks. Um, is I think we have time for maybe just one question. Uh, so let's see. <laughs> I can't see the the uh, group. There's there's a, there's, a, there's mics coming. Uh, there we go. Okay, in the front, in the middle. I see. Two hands up. <laughs> hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, great speak, uh, great speeches and everything. It's been a nice event. Um, I think what I get caught on with all the climate change stuff and everything is that uh, I think thinking globally and acting locally is great. And um, I just feel like the reality is, unless we change like hearts and minds on a really significant, like internal way, nothing's really gonna change change. And I guess um, like ultimately with human population, we're kind of transforming the world into humans. And that's cool. Uh, but of course that comes at the cost of all the biodiversity. And right, the beauty of life is all this biodiversity and the, um, ecological resilience comes from biodiversity. Uh, but we're not even really willing to address uh, cats in an urban space who kill so many birds and reduce biodiversity, and that's also on us. Um, and really, like, if we could enact uh, some kind of population incentive control or decrease, we would have stronger biodiversity and be able to heal better. But of course, that's such a, to us, such an unthinkable thing. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we uh, kind of reframe and push towards our own approach to kind of uh, ecological preservation and kind of take humans who are so important and kind of try to look at us as just part of this system, which we truly are, to help have a stronger, healthier system? Thank you. Yeah. Anybody want to? I can say from my personal experience um, on the Bronx River, one of the most successful like activation points and moments for community members who maybe have never thought of themselves as part of a larger ecological system is like getting them on the Bronx River. Like show how small and how impactful you are, like both how important and how like insignificant like at the same time you are in the scope of, of the natural system um, and just falling in love with that natural system and the ecology and seeing animals you didn't even know existed in your neighborhood. Um, that is a huge activation point. So like getting folks to fall in love in that way in like very tangible, visceral ways is important. And I think that most people will like follow you, you know, um, but you have to like, you have to build it so that they will come, right? And that's, I think, part of a lot of what the folks in this room are trying to contribute to. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it's working on multiple scales, right? So Victoria describes an individual coming to know nature and falling in love with nature. Sarah describes working with cities across the country to um, be more intentional about their interaction with nature. Um, we at the New York Botanical Garden are working around the globe um, and also often working with governments to help them understand how they can better preserve nature. So we all have to bring our individual passion and commitment um, through our to professional channels and our professional expertise to understand that we have to work on all these scales at the same time 
together. Thanks. Um, I think I'm going to do speed round, and then uh, we'll start wrapping up. All right. Tell us one thing that you don't want to miss the rest of the day. Dustin. <laughs> it was, that's really hard. <laughs> um, I did prepare yeah. you for this um, question. I, <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking about it since then. <laughs> No, I, I think the, um, the target session, uh, how do you uh, establish ecological targets and, and restoration targets? Because the conservation that we're doing now is, we're doing it for now, but it's really about the future. And these trade-offs that we're making now and the decisions we're making now, uh, we're, it's gonna be influencing the way that future generations live. So you got to go first, so if somebody else has the same one, they're in trouble. Sarah? Yeah. Um, I'm excited for a lot of the day, but I'm especially excited for the last panel of the afternoon, the where do we go from here opportunity to think about where we collectively go and also to learn from some of our national partners. Um, I'm excited for difficult decisions because misery loves company. <laughs> That was also my choice, huh? Thanks. <laughs> Misery loves company. <laughs> Elizabeth, any thoughts for us uh, as we close this panel up? Well, I, I, I will just say, I, I, you know, I am not a practitioner. I'm, um, you know, really filled with admiration and respect and gratitude for the work that you guys all do. And I sometimes have felt you know, as I go around the world, you know, just writing about the things that you guys do, you know, should I just be out there, you know, planting, um, you know, salt marsh grasses? <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's really a lot to be said for that. And so I just want to express my, my real respect and gratitude for all that you guys are doing, trying to do. Thank you so, so much, everybody on the panel. And I hope you have a great day.